Hi friends, welcome back to my kitchen. I have a busy couple days ahead of me as far as preservation goes. September is going to be a very busy month for us. We have family visiting, and we're also going to be processing our second batch of chickens here in the next couple weeks. So with all of that, I want to make sure I can get as much as I possibly can preserved in the next couple days. So while we have family here, I'm not overwhelmed with a bunch that needs to get done. So I think what I'm gonna start out with is pressure canning some green beans. I have a box here inside the house that I'm gonna start on, and we have a ton more out in the garden. So we're gonna start with that, just see what we can get done. My first step in getting my green beans canned was just washing up some jars. I had a couple new flats of wide mouth pint jars to use up this day. I don't know about you, but every year I think I finally have enough jars and every year I end up needing more. So Facebook Marketplace has been a great source for jars as well. I always find great deals on there and sometimes you can find different designs that aren't around anymore. A few years back, I got two boxes of at least 30 quarts each for $10 a box and I just wish that I had bought more from that listing. It was such a steal. So I set up my clean jars in one side and then cleaned out the other side of my sink, filled it up with beans and water, gave them a good rinse, and per pint, you're going to need about a pound of beans. I'm just snapping off the ends of the beans and snapping them into pieces to pack my pint jars to an inch of headspace. If you want to be more precise in the size, feel free to chop them, but I enjoy the process of snapping the beans. This setup makes the process really quick and easy. Some of these beans ended up being a little bit bigger than ideal. We planted bush beans this year, which I haven't done for years, and I just remembered why. I find them a little bit harder to harvest. I'm definitely more of a pole bean type of person, so going forward, that is likely what we will continue to do. Now, completely optional, I like to add a half teaspoon of sea salt per pint, but you can omit this. You could top with broth, however, I am topping my beans with hot water to an inch of headspace. Then I'm just debubbling and adjusting headspace. I actually overfilled these a little initially, so I had to go back through. And then I'm going to be adding on my lids and my rings. To the bottom of my pressure canner, I added three quarts of water and my canning rack. Now, typically I'd add a splash of vinegar to the pressure canner to help prevent mineral buildup on the outside of the jars, but I ran out, not the best thing to run out of during canning season. And today we are going to be double stacking, which is something that my Presto pressure canner can do. I'm just going to be adding another canning rack between the two layers of jars. Thank you. 
These will process in a pressure canner for 20 minutes for pints or 25 minutes for quarts at 10 pounds of pressure if you're using a weighted gauge canner or 11 pounds of pressure if you're using a dial gauge canner, which I am. Of course, as always, you're going to want to adjust accordingly depending on your elevation. It is the next morning, so all I got done last night were 13 pints of our beans with plenty more in the garden that need to be harvested and preserved as well. Now, the first couple things that I'm going to be working on this morning are a roasted cherry tomato and corn salsa, and then a plum sauce. So the cherry tomato and corn salsa is a ball canning recipe, but I am going to be roasting the tomatoes, the onions, the corn, and the jalapenos. That is just going to add a ton of flavor. So that is gonna be the first thing that we're working on this morning. For the roasted cherry tomato and corn salsa, I started by quartering my cherry tomatoes and adding them onto a parchment lined baking sheet. Then I roasted these for about 20 minutes at 400 degrees. In the future, I personally would not bother with slicing up the tomatoes because later on you'll see I decided to pulse them in the food processor for a salsa that wasn't quite as chunky. So you can do just what you prefer here. Now to another lined baking sheet, I cut off the kernels from two ears of corn for a total of two cups. I also added to this baking sheet a cup of finely chopped red onions and two jalapenos. This also roasted at 400 for about 20 minutes. Once the tomatoes were done, I added them into the food processor in batches and pulsed them. The last batch, I added in some cilantro to equal a half cup chopped.
I added the tomatoes, cilantro, corn, red onion, and jalapenos to a large pot and stirred in half a cup of bottled lime juice. It does need to be bottled as specified in this recipe, not fresh, just to make sure that the acidity is high enough. I also added in one teaspoon of chipotle powder, which is optional, and I brought this up to a boil and then reduced the heat to a simmer for about 10 minutes. I did end up adding in maybe about half a teaspoon of sea salt and a tablespoon of honey. I find that many of the tested salsa recipes can be quite acidic tasting due to all of the vinegar, lemon juice, lime juice, whatever it is that it calls for. So we found that extra little bit of sweetness was a nice addition. I filled my clean hot pint jars to half an inch of headspace, wiped off these rims really well, and added on lids and rings to fingertip tight. This salsa processes for 15 minutes in a water bath canner and as always, adjust the processing time if needed based on your elevation. My next canning recipe is the spicy Asian plum sauce. This is a recipe from the all new ball book of canning and preserving. I started by pitting four pounds of plums and adding them to my food processor and roughly chopping them. I did this in batches. I also added in one medium onion. I actually had a couple super small ones, so that's what I used instead, plus three cloves of garlic. Now I'm not worried about this being too uniform because we are going to blend it all up once it's simmered anyways. So to a large pot I added the plums, one and a half cups of brown sugar. I actually used panela cane sugar which is just an unrefined cane sugar in place of the brown sugar. Then half a cup of rice vinegar or apple cider vinegar, a quarter cup of soy sauce. I used tamari as a gluten free option and I brought this to a boil, then reduced the heat down to medium low and allowed this to simmer for about 20 minutes until everything was nice and soft.
Then I added in our seasonings. I adjusted these a bit based on personal preference. I'll leave the original recipe plus my adjustments in the description box down below. The recipe calls for fennel, cinnamon, cloves, and star anise, which I omitted. And I added in one teaspoon of sea salt, four teaspoons of chili flakes, a half teaspoon of black pepper, and four teaspoons of ground ginger. I let this simmer for another 20 minutes or so, then blended it up with my immersion blender. You could also do this in batches in the food processor or blender, but an immersion blender is just so handy. This should make about four pints. So to clean hot jars, I added my plum sauce to a quarter inch of headspace. Then I wiped off the rims really well, added lids and rings to fingertip tight, and the plum sauce processes for 10 minutes, again, adjusting the processing time for elevation if necessary. My basement fridge, which we typically use for eggs and any of my extra ferments and some of our garden vegetable storage, has just been taken over by our cabbage harvest for some time now. It's been fine up until this point because we downsized our flock to make room for some new layers and they haven't started laying yet, but that's not going to be the case for much longer, so I need to get some of this cabbage dealt with. I decided to slice and freeze a bunch of it and I also did some cabbage steak rounds. Now, it is typically recommended to blanch vegetables prior to freezing, 
and I do most of the time. The purpose of blanching them prior to freezing is to stop the enzyme action, which helps the vegetables hold their color and nutrients. I have heard that cabbage freezes pretty well in food saver bags, so I decided to try this. I like to use it in soups, stir fries, etc. and if I was to blanch it, it would definitely be a little bit softer, so I'm just curious to see if the texture holds up a bit better by skipping that step. Now, the cabbage steaks, I didn't want to do a whole lot of just because, again, I'm not sure how this will turn out, but that would be really neat if they did hold their texture enough to cook up in a cast iron pan. If you did want to freeze the cabbage but wanted to take the extra step of blanching, I would just steam blanch it so it's not sitting directly in the water, and I would steam blanch it for about two minutes, and I'd skip over the ice bath and dry it off really well before freezing. Okay, we are going into day three of this video, which wasn't what I had originally anticipated, but it's just kind of how things have gone. There was a bunch that I didn't get to yesterday that we're going to be working on today. So I have some celery to freeze. We have some plums to get dehydrated. I have not done like a full harvest of our plums yet. I really need to get to that within the next couple days, but I've just been grabbing what I can deal with from the tree right out our back door and working on that. That way I don't have boxes of them sitting on my dining room table overwhelming me. So we're going to be dehydrating some plums and then we are also going to be making a couple different salts. So we are going to be making a celery salt and then a onion salt. And I think that's it, so we'll see how it goes. To prepare my celery, I am taking the time to blanch it. So I'm just slicing it up, steam blanching for two minutes, and then adding it to a baking sheet to cool off. Again, I am not putting this in an ice bath because I don't want it to become waterlogged. So once it's cooled, I am going to be adding this to some food saver bags in one cup portions to add to meals throughout the winter months. I was really hesitant to purchase a food saver, but it really has been such a great investment, especially now that we are raising our own meat. In fact, I think the year before we got one, I told my husband that I would never own one, but we do utilize it quite a bit now. I really do try to avoid using any excess plastic when I can, but everything does stay so much fresher using the food saver I have found versus freezing in freezer bags or glass, which I have done in the past. The bulk of our plums, we end up dehydrating. We have, I think, six plum trees here on our property. Most of those are Italian plums, but two are a different variety that I'm not sure of. 
which we didn't get a single plum from this year. I think it had something to do with the weird, hot, dry spring that we had this year. This is the first batch of dehydrated plums that I'm doing this year, but I'll have both dehydrators going for the next several days in attempt to get the bulk of our plums used up. I'm also planning to try a plum salsa recipe, so if that is something that interests you, definitely let me know in the comments down below, and maybe I can share that. I'll definitely be making a video on my plum jalapeno jam recipe. That is something that has been requested multiple times and I am due to make another batch. The plums will dehydrate at 135 for about 14 to 18 hours I've found and this is really going to vary on their size so it's something that you're going to want to be checking on quite a bit as you get to the end of that time. Now I find that they dehydrate best with the cut side down even though it does make the trays a little bit harder to clean up. Now I have a bunch of onion tops to use up. I have found one of my favorite ways to preserve onion tops or chives is simply to slice them up and freeze in a jar. No flash freezing, they stay separated really nicely. I just put them directly into a jar, add an old lid and put them straight into the freezer. I really love having these on hand for that fresh green onion flavor to add to any of my cooking. For my herb salts, I've shared this process before, but it's really simple, just two cups of herbs, whatever you prefer, to one cup of salt. I typically use a coarse salt for this, and then I pulse all of the ingredients together in a food processor. Then I will lay them out on a parchment lined dehydrator tray and dry for about six hours at 105. You could also dry this out in your oven at the lowest temperature with the door cracked a little bit or even just on the counter laid out on a cookie sheet for a couple days. I did an onion salt with six cups of onion tops and three cups of coarse salt. I mentioned my plan was to make a celery salt as well using the leaves of my celery stalks but they ended up being a little bit bitter, so they just went straight to the chickens. The stalks themselves were not bitter at all. They were great, just the tops, so I'm assuming this is probably due to a lack of water. At this point in the season, the garden is producing plenty, but it is looking a little bit neglected, so that is a project for me sometime this week as well. That is all for today's video. Thank you guys for joining me the past couple days in my preserving kitchen, and we will see you in the next video.